Well, welcome to this final session of the series. This is something different. We're going to be looking at the fascinating topic of respiration under the conditions of extreme hypoxia on the summit of Mount Everest. But in, the addi but in addition, it's something of a an adventure story because uh, we're going to be talking about a medical expedition to Mount Everest, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Let me start by asking a question. Why would anybody take the time and the effort to arrange a, an expedition, a research expedition, to the summit of Mount Everest? And the reason is an interesting one. It turns out that by a remarkable coincidence, the partial pressure of oxygen on the summit of Mount Everest is right at the limit of human tolerance to oxygen deprivation. Now, I say that's a coincidence. If someone can give me an evolutionary reason for it, I'd like to hear about it. But it's one of those cosmic coincidences like the size of the moon being just right to give us a total eclipse of the sun. So what's the evidence that Everest is near the limits of human tolerance to hypoxia? Well, here's some rather anecdotal data. Here are the highest altitudes attained by climbers during the last century. And you can see that as long ago as 1924, a climber called Norton got to within 300 meters of the summit of Mount Everest without supplementary oxygen. But the mountain wasn't climbed until 1953 by Hillary and Tenzing, and they used supplementary oxygen. And it was not until 1978 that two European climbers, Messner and Havala, managed to reach the summit without supplementary oxygen. So one way of looking at these data is that the last 300 meters took 54 years. So that perhaps is an indication of the delicate state of affairs at these extreme altitudes. Now that's very anecdotal. Let me give you something more scientific. Here are measurements of maximal oxygen consumption, mils per minute per kilo of body weight, plotted against barometric pressure, which of course declines as altitude increases. And these are all measurements from acclimatized subjects. And you can see that in this group of subjects at sea level, the maximal oxygen uptake was about 50 mils per minute per kilo. It drops off rapidly with increasing altitude. And if we're bold enough to extrapolate this line to the summit of Mount Everest, we get a very interesting prediction. It looks as though all the oxygen available is going to be required for the basal oxygen uptake. Body takes a certain amount of oxygen to keep the heart pumping and the brain ticking over. And so it's not at all clear how there's any oxygen available for actually climbing at these great altitudes. So we decided to organize an expedition to Mount Everest, which, as you know, is on the border between Tibet and Nepal. We approached it from the south, from Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, and we walked into the Everest region. At that time, and this was 1981, there were no roads within 100 miles of Everest. In fact, there are very few now. But uh, so everything had to be carried in, and here's one of the early camps. Here's uh, parts of one of the laboratories being carried in, and here's a very awkward load of insulating material uh, on its way in. After about three weeks or so, we get to the monastery of Tangbochi. It's a Buddhist monastery. It's right on the trekking route to Everest from the south, so everybody who's heading for Everest calls in at Tangbochi. And we took the opportunity of having a, uh, an interview with the chief, uh, the chief Lama, the abbot of Tangbochi, and we asked him what was the most important element for success on Everest, because he's seen all the expeditions coming into Everest from the south uh, since, the Mount, since the country opened up in the late 1940s. And he said the most, and I was expecting some deep spiritual Buddhist reply, he said the most important thing was luck. Well, I have to say he used, I think, the term karma, meaning everything coming together uh, appropriately. And he was absolutely right, as you'll hear. Now, after another few days of trekking, we get to the Everest Base Camp, which is shown here. 
you can see the tents on the glacier at the bottom, and then the behind is the ice fall. The ice fall is formed by a it's a, uh, a a waterfall of ice with the high valley up here, and it drops down about 700 meters, about 2,000 feet or so, uh, to this valley below. And the ice fall is composed of a series of enormous blocks of ice. Uh, and of course it's moving slowly because it's a glacier. And if you're in the ice fall, everything's nice and quiet for a bit, then there's a terrific crash as one of these big blocks falls over. And then it's quiet again for 15 or 20 minutes, there's another crash, and another one falls over. Well, since the route goes through the ice fall between these blocks of ice, it's a matter of Russian roulette as to whether a climber is under one of these blocks when it falls over or not, so it's a dangerous part of the uh, route. The first thing we did when we got to the base camp was to put together the base camp laboratory, shown here, made of plastic panels that were bolted together and gave us a very nice lab during the months of September and October in 1981. Now the next slide is a panoramic view of the Everest region. Over here is the summit of Everest at 8848 meters, a little over 29,000 feet, and of course the highest point in the world. Over here is a mountain called Lutsi, and this is Nupsi, and this is this high valley I mentioned before, uh, surrounded by these uh, enormous peaks, all, all 8,000 meter peaks and above. Then we have the ice fall here, and our base camp is down here, just obscured by this mountain in the foreground, and our route is going to take us up through the ice fall to, from the base camp to Camp 1 at the top of the ice fall. The camps are about one day's uh, trek apart. And then from Camp 1, we're going to go up through this high valley to Camp 2, which was the main laboratory camp. That's where a, a large research program was carried out, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then later in the expedition, the climbers and what we call the climbing scientists went up the uh, face of Everest here, Camp 3, Camp 4. Camp 5 was just above the South Col. A col is a depression between two peaks, in this case Everest here and Lhotse here. And then from the highest camp, they're going to try and get to the summit of Everest and back in one day. Of course, they don't want to be kept out. They don't want to be, uh, uh, find themselves spending the night without protection. So they get back in the same day to Camp 5, our highest camp. So now I'm going to show you a few uh, images taken during the uh, movement up through the ice fall, Camp 1, and then Camp 2. I'll tell you something about the scientific program, and then I'll finish by attempts to get to the summit. Now, it's not particularly difficult to get to the base camp. Uh, it's fairly high at, at uh, 5,400 meters, 17,500 feet or so, but uh, the terrain is not particularly difficult. But once you get above the base camp, then you're into difficult terrain. And here are people putting ladders over one of the crevasses. Here's another picture of a crevasse here. And uh, this is Everest on the, on the left, you can see. Here's another view in the ice fall, and you can get a feel for these enormous blocks of ice, or seracs as they're called, and how unstable they are. And uh, these climbers, of course, are at risk if one of these things falls over. Here's another view. Now we are high in the ice fall. I can see the tracks of the climbers here. And this is the fluted appearance of Nupsi behind us, very beautiful mountain ridge here. Another photograph taken uh, towards the evening of uh, some climbers coming up here. I can just see them uh, near the top of the ice fall. And finally, we get to Camp 1 at the top of the ice fall. It wasn't used for uh, research purposes. We didn't carry out any experiments there, but loads were dropped there and carried and taken on the following day up to Camp 2. Here's the route up to Camp 2. We're now in this high valley, uh, which is much flatter, but it's still rather treacherous because there are hidden crevasses, and that's why the climbers uh, uh, rope together. And here's our first view of Camp 2. Uh, you can see this tiny camp, which is dwarfed by these gigantic mountains around us. 
Here's the southwest face of Everest here. Uh, here's Lhotse over here. Some of you may have read about early expeditions to Everest and will have heard about the Geneva Spur, which is here, and here is the South Col. Uh, here's a view of the laboratory that we used at this uh, Camp 2. This is an altitude of 6,300 meters, about 21,000 feet, so it's pretty high, but the laboratory was well equipped. Uh, it was made of an aluminum frame over which were placed fiberglass blankets. The whole thing was kept warm with a uh, kerosene uh, uh, heater, and we had electrical power from uh, solar generators and also from a gasoline uh, generator as well. So we had a lot of sophisticated equipment, blood gas, electrodes, uh, uh, cycle ergometer, sleep monitoring equipment, uh, and so on. Uh, so it was quite a well-equipped laboratory in spite of its uh, very remote location. Now this slide shows the various sites where we were hoping to make experiments on Everest. And first of all, we've got the base camp laboratory here, which I showed you. That's the prefabricated hut, if you like. And then we come to this very unpleasant icefall. And above that, in this high valley called the Western Coombe, we have our main laboratory camp at 6,300 meters. And big experimental program there. We hope to make a few measurements at Camp 5, which is just above the, ice, the uh, South Col, very high, over 8,000 meters, over 26,000 feet, so very high. Hope to get a few measurements there, and we even, even hope to get a few measurements on the summit. Now that was very ambitious because a lot of, ex a lot of expeditions go to Mount, to Mount Everest and they never reach the summit. Of course, we always hear about the ones who do, but uh, lots go there. In fact, I look back on the six expeditions prior to our own and not one of them reached the summit. It depends on the weather. If the weather's bad, forget it. Uh, it depends on whether there are enough fit people left who can tolerate the altitude and so on. But we were a, a fortunate expedition, as you'll hear, and we were able to get a few measurements on the summit, and I'm going to tell you about them. But first of all, I'm going to tell you about some measurements we made at the base camp. And let me introduce these by reminding you, as we said in an earlier session, that at very high altitude, the most important feature of adaptation or climatization is extreme hyperventilation. It, it was quite clear from modeling studies that we did before the expedition that you hadn't a hope of, of surviving at these great altitudes unless you hyperventilated to a great extent and maintained a viable alveolar PO2. So we decided to look at the ventilatory response to hypoxia. In other words, the increase in ventilation that climbers got when they were given a hypoxic mixture. You can do that at high altitude with natural hypoxia, or you can do it at sea level by giving somebody a low oxygen mixture to breathe. And we measured the ventilatory response to hypoxia in a group of climbers, and we ranked them depending on their hypoxic ventilatory response. Well, we were lucky in that we had a very large range of responses, as you can see. Uh, and there's incidentally nothing you can do about your hypoxic ventilatory response. You're born with it and there's no way of changing it. Uh, and so we ranked the climbers in this way and a very strange thing happened when we looked at the data. It turns out that the climber who got to the summit first had the highest response, the one who got to the summit second had the second highest response, and the one who got to the summit third had the third highest response. Well, that's got to be partly by chance, but it certainly suggests that there is a relationship between the hypoxic ventilatory response and tolerance to extreme altitude. And actually this was also well seen in a couple of the people who were unlucky enough to have very low responses. One of them was the climbing leader responsible for the logistics on the mountain and he found that if he went above Camp 2, he got a headache, uh, nausea, vomiting. It was quite clear that he couldn't spend a lot of time at extreme altitude and so that again was an indication that there seems to be a link between the ventilatory response to hypoxia and tolerance to extreme altitude and the reasons for that will become clearer in a few minutes.
Now we also did a lot of measurements at the main laboratory camp here, 6300 meters, and I don't have time to tell you uh, much about them, but I just want to mention some measurements we made of neuropsychological function because they're interesting. Everybody knows that the central nervous system is very intolerant of oxygen deprivation. Uh, an example is somebody falls into a swimming pool, they're fished out uh, five or ten minutes later, they are revived, but their brain never recovers its full function. So it's the central nervous system that is very susceptible to hypoxia. And so it wasn't surprising that when we went to altitudes uh, like uh, the, these higher altitudes on Everest, we were able to show uh, impairment of neuropsychological function, particularly short-term memory and also a test of manipulative skill, which was a finger tapping test. That wasn't surprising because we were very hypoxic under those conditions. What was surprising was that when we got back to sea level and made measurements after the expedition, we found that two of the measurements were still abnormal. One was short-term memory, but that came back within about 12 months. The other was the, the test of manipulative skill, the finger tapping test, which remained abnormal in most people uh, even after 12 months back at sea level. So uh, what, we, what we gathered from this is that you can't go to these extreme altitudes encounter this very severe hypoxia and have the central nervous system escape completely unscathed. There is some residual impairment. Uh, I think this was one of the first times that this had been described, but it's been confirmed many times since now on other expeditions. Now I'd like to move on and tell you about measurements that we made on the summit, because in some ways these are the most uh, interesting and actually surprising uh, measurements we made. And again, one of the questions we asked was, to what extent do people increase their ventilation on the summit? Because it was clear from modeling studies that increasing the ventilation was absolutely critical in maintaining a viable alveolar PO2. And the question was, well, how would we measure ventilation on the summit? Well, we used the, the um, alveolar ventilation equation, uh, which we've talked about many times in these series, in this series. Uh, that equation, you recall, shows that there's an inverse relationship between the level of alveolar ventilation and the alveolar PCO2. If the CO2 production is constant, as it's likely to be in a, a resting subject, irrespective of the altitude. And so we took alveolar gas samples on the summit, brought them back to the University of California, San Diego, and I should just emphasize here, the whole expedition was run out of UCSD, brought the samples back here and measured the PCO2. And the results were very interesting. What we found was, and here we've got the alveolar PCO2 in tor or millimeters of mercury, same thing on this axis, plotted against the barometric pressure, which decreases as altitude increases. The means of the measurements we made at several altitudes are shown by the triangles. The, open, the, the closed circles here are previous data from uh, uh, other expeditions. And you can see that there's a fair bit of scatter, but that the PCO2 falls more or less linearly with barometric pressure. And on the summit of Mount Everest, the measurement we got was between seven and eight millimeters of mercury. Now that's a fantastically low alveolar PCO2, substantially lower than we had expected, by the way. And when you think about it, if the normal PCO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury, a value of eight means that the climber has increased his alveolar ventilation fivefold. So fantastic increase in ventilation. And incidentally, we had some anecdotal evidence of this because the man who made the measurement on the summit, as you'll see a little bit later, Dr. Chris Pizzo, he also recorded information on the summit using a, a tape recorder. Uh, one of the things we were wondering about is how people were going to record data that they, that measurements that they made on the summit. We weren't going to rely on the remembering them. We were, wanted them to record them on the summit, and we had various ways of doing that. But the best way, as it turned out, was to use a small handheld tape recorder, 
and uh, we still have the tapes that Pizzo recorded on the summit. The important point is he sounds like a patient in the last stages of respiratory failure. He has to take a breath between uh, every one or two words. He's so short of breath. So it's fantastic degree of ventilation on the summit, tremendous shortness of breath, and that's necessary uh, in order to survive. Well now, more data can be, more information can be obtained if we plot the alveolar gas data on an oxygen carbon dioxide diagram. You may remember we used this diagram when we talked about the uh, gas exchange, particularly ventilation perfusion inequality. And this diagram has PCO2 on the vertical axis, PO2 on the horizontal axis. And what it shows is that the alveolar PO2 and PCO2, as you go from sea level here, see at sea level the PO2 is about 100, PCO2 is nearly 40, a little bit below in these particular people. And then as you go to higher and higher altitudes, both the PO2 and the PCO2 fall. The PO2 falls because of the reduction of the PO2 in the air around you. That's because of the fall in barometric pressure, of course. The PCO2 falls because of the increasing hyperventilation. There's no other reason why the PCO2 falls. It's simply the hyperventilation. And you see an interesting thing from this plot. Once you get to a particular altitude, it's around about 7,000 meters or so, there's no further fall in the alveolar PO2. In other words, it's defended at a region of about 35, 37 millimeters of mercury. And the only way you can defend the alveolar PO2 from the falling value in the air around you is by increasing hyperventilation. Uh, in other words, you're sort of insulating the PO2 in the lung, in the alveolar gas, from the falling value in the air around you. Now, in order to do that, you've got to mount an enormous degree of hyperventilation. And you, you drive the PCO2 down, the PCO2 down to about seven or eight millimeters of mercury in order to maintain an alveolar PO2 of about 35 or so. So if any of you are thinking of climbing Mount Everest, you might want to go along to the local hospital or whatever and have your ventilatory response to hypoxia measured. Not a particularly difficult measurement to make. Uh, have that measured. If it's low, give up any hope of climbing Mount Everest. Take up another hobby such as gardening because you're not going to get to the summit of Mount Everest until you've got a reasonably good ventilatory response to hypoxia. So the alveolar PO2 is round about 35 or so millimeters of mercury. What about the arterial value? Well now unfortunately we were not able to take arterial blood on the summit. Sometimes people ask me, they say, why not? I mean, nice pictures, you'll see them, uh, blue sky and so on, looks very nice up there. Actually, conditions are extremely severe. Uh, the cold is very uh, intense. There's usually a very high wind, big chill factor. So it's very difficult to make measurements on the summit. And incidentally, I just might mention that the measurements we made in 1981 have not been repeated since then. Uh, and we're still waiting for somebody else to do them. At any event, uh, we were not able to take arterial blood on the summit, although I hope one of these days uh, somebody will. Uh, but instead, we had to calculate the arterial PO2 from the data we had available. And we used what is called the Bohr integration. And actually, we talked about that when we were uh, talking about the uh, diffusion properties of the blood gas barrier. And you remember when we were talking about this, we plotted the increase in PO2 on this axis as the blood loaded oxygen along the capillary. And you remember the blood comes in under sea level conditions with a PO2 of about 40, rises very rapidly, quite early in the capillary. So after about a third of the time available, uh, there's no difference between alveolar gas, the PO2 of alveolar gas and end capillary blood. So there's no problem with equilibration at sea level. But look what happens if we do exactly the same calculations based on the data that we obtained and uh, on the summit of Mount Everest. Here the, P the blood comes into the lung with a PO2 of about 20 or so, rises very slowly along the pulmonary capillary. So at the end of the capillary, there's still a big PO2 difference between alveolar gas and end capillary blood. And of course, 
we know that that means that there's diffusion limitation of oxygen transfer, something that never, hardly ever happens uh, to the normal lung under sea level conditions, possibly elite athletes at extreme levels of exercise, but under most conditions, we never get diffusion impairment in the normal lung at sea level, but at high altitude, uh, at these extreme altitudes that occurs. You may say, why does the PO2 rise slow, so slowly? Well, it has to do with the fact that we're working very low on the oxygen dissociation curve. And the slope of the oxygen dissociation curve is so steep that that makes the rise, the rate of rise of PO2 so slow. So the PO2, the arterial PO2, based on these calculations, is less than the alveolar value because of diffusion limitation. What about the, the acid-base status of the body? Now, remember we talked about acid-base status at length in one of the uh, sessions, and we pointed out how closely this is related to the, the uh, PCO2 value, the arterial PCO2. And so with an alveolar uh, PCO2 of seven or eight millimeters of mercury, what's gonna happen to the, to the acid-base status? Well, we use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Now, you won't be familiar with this plot, but it's basically a plot of the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, which, as you remember, relates PCO2, bicarbonate, or basic cess, and, uh, and uh, pH. And so we plugged in the PCO2 from the alveolar gas measurements. We assumed the arterial value was the same, and that's a reasonable assumption. We put in the basic cess that we measured in two climbers uh, the morning after their summit climb, and that gave us a calculated arterial pH between 7.7 .7 and 7.8, enormously high pH in the arterial blood. So here we've got a, a very severe respiratory alkalosis with a small degree of metabolic compensation. So very interesting situation for acid base. So let's summarize the results that we found on the Everest summit, and these are the best data we've got to date from measurements made in the field. The uh, altitude of Everest, 8848 meters, and we measured, in fact, we got the first direct measurement of barometric pressure, uh, which was 253 millimeters of mercury, almost exactly one third of the sea level value. Of course, we had a reasonably good idea of what to expect, but nevertheless, it's nice to get the first direct measurement. It was a little bit higher than we had expected. That gives us, gives us an inspired PO2 of 43, because the oxygen concentration in the air, the fractional concentration is, is uh, 0.21, 21%. The alveolar PO2 is about 35. The arterial PO2 is somewhat lower because of diffusion limitation, around about 28 to 30. And incidentally, a few years after our field expedition, there was a simulated climb of Mount Everest using low pressure chambers. Uh, and uh, they measured the arterial PO2 at the barometric pressure on the, on the uh, uh, summit as they in the low pressure chamber, and that was about 30. So the, they got a very, very similar measurement. PCO2, we got round about seven or eight, and the pH over 7.7. .7. So these are fantastically remarkable, uh, remarkable uh, change in the normal physiological status. I mean, it's remarkable that a normal subject can tolerate such a tremendous alteration in the normal physiology of, of gas exchange and come back and, and live to tell the tale. In, in fact, sometimes I uh, give this lecture to people who work in the intensive care unit, where of course patients with extremely severe disease are being treated. I ask them, have they ever seen a patient with such abnormal blood gases as this? And nobody's ever come up and said they had. So it is very remarkable. It, it shows the extreme resilience of the human body, that you can tolerate this extreme change in uh, normal physiology, gas exchange, and uh, return to tell the tale. Now this very high pH, this very severe respiratory alkalosis is interesting because one of the things it does, you recall from our session on blood gas transport, 
One of the things that an increase in pH does is it shifts the oxygen dissociation curve to the left, or if you like, it increases the oxygen affinity for hemoglobin. And it's interesting that if we look at the range of oxygen association curves, and here we're plotting oxygen saturation against PO2, the range in, terrestri in, in animals that live at sea level, that's the range of oxygen association curves that you get, then animals that live, mammals that live at high altitude, for example the vicuña and the llama in the South American Andes, they have a left shifted curve. They have an increased oxygen affinity. And what's even more remarkable is if you look at a whole series of animals, not just mammals, a whole series of animals throughout the animal kingdom, they've, all, many of them have developed all sorts of strategies for increasing the oxygen affinity of the hemoglobin in a hypoxic environment. And there are all sorts of strategies here. I'm certainly not going to go into them. The one that is best known to at least medical people is the human fetus, because the human fetus, you recall, has fetal hemoglobin, uh, and that has a high oxygen affinity, and that is a good thing because the fetus is in a very hypoxic environment. In fact, the arterial PO2, uh, the, uh, the PO2 in the descending aorta of the fetus is quite similar to the PO2 of a climber on the summit of Mount Everest. So uh, all sorts of strategies have been uh, employed to increase the oxygen affinity of the hemoglobin in a hypoxic environment. And isn't it remarkable that the climber on the summit of Mount Everest does exactly the same thing, but through an entirely different mechanism. And that's through a mechanism of extreme respiratory alkalosis, which again increases the oxygen affinity of the hemoglobin. And the reason why an increase in oxygen affinity of the hemoglobin is so important is it enhances the uptake of oxygen in the pulmonary capillary. You may say, well, doesn't it interfere with the release of oxygen in the periphery of the body? Yes, it does, but you can show that the, that the value in enhancing the uptake uh, is greater than the disadvantage that you get at the periphery of the body. Now I started by saying that we couldn't understand how a climber could get to the summit of Mount Everest with the amount of oxygen available, uh, and so we were anxious to measure the maximal oxygen uptake on the Everest summit. Now I should say what we really did is we measured the maximal oxygen uptake of a climber, of a very well acclimatized climber, breathing the same inspired PO2 as the summit. We, we couldn't put a bicycle ergometer on the summit of Mount Everest. But what we did was we took extremely well acclimatized uh, subjects, put them in the Camp 2 laboratory, very high, 6,300 meters, gave them 14% oxygen to breathe, uh, double whammy. And that gave them the inspired PO2 of 43, and we were able to measure the maximal oxygen uptake. As you can see, it's a miserable value. It comes out to be about one liter a minute. And that's the oxygen uptake of somebody walking slowly across uh, uh, on the level, a miserable maximal oxygen uptake. But it's apparently just sufficient to explain how a climber can get to the summit. If you go back and read the accounts of Mesner and Habala as they made their final ascent, uh, it was extremely slow. It took them over an hour to ascend the last 100 meters of vertical height. They were moving very, very slowly, and if you make the calculations, that fits reasonably well with the uh, measurement of maximal oxygen uptake here. And incidentally, essentially exactly the same uh, value was found in the simulated ascent of Mount Everest uh, called Operation Everest II. Okay, that's all I'm going to say pretty much about the physiology. I'm going to conclude by telling you about attempts of the climbers to get to the summit because it's an interesting story. So here we have a couple of climbers here. They're looking up the Western Coombe. In fact, you can just see a couple of climbers here if you look carefully. And they're about to go up the southwest face here, up to Camp 3, somewhere here, Camp 4, Camp 5. And as I indicated before, they're going to try and get from Camp 5 to the summit and back in one day because they don't want to be caught out uh, without protection uh, overnight. And so I'm going to show you a few photographs here. Here's one en route to Camp 3. Now, it may take you a moment uh, 
to become uh, uh, oriented here, but here are climbers coming up a fixed rope on the way to Camp 3, and we're looking down at the glacier in the Western Coombe here, and the uh, Camp 2 is somewhere down here. I can't see it, but they're coming up a fixed rope here. Here's the traverse across to Camp 3, rather steep as you can see. When the climbers got to the site of Camp 3, they found that the snow and ice were so steep that they couldn't pitch their tents. Uh, but they thought of that possibility and so they took up an aluminum frame. They put their tents on top of this and that's where they had their sleeping bags. They were careful to tie into the frame overnight because if you fell out of bed, you fell about 2,000 feet down to Camp 2 below. So it wasn't a popular camp. Here's a view of the traverse going across from Camp 3. Now this is taken later in the expedition. By mid-October, many of us had despaired of getting to the summit. Uh, we'd had a couple of groups who got to Camp 5, but the, the temperatures were so low, the wind speed was so high, the chill factor was so intense, there was no way they could go above Camp 5. But fortunately, in mid-October, the uh, weather improved, and Chris Kopzinski, one of our strongest climbers, together with Sherpa Sondere, made their way up from Camp 5, and here they are on uh, Everest here. In the distance, we can see Lhotse, and this is the valley from which they've come, and they're now high enough to look over the ridge of Lhotse into southern Nepal. Here's another photograph. This is the old Camp 6 site uh, used by previous expeditions. We didn't use it ourselves. There are a couple of old tents here. It's a nice picture, though, because it shows Makalu, which is, I think, the fifth highest mountain in the world. And actually, uh, I was on the Makalu Col way back in 1961 here and made one of the measurements of maximal oxygen consumption that actually I showed in the uh, second slide I showed today. Here's uh, another view taken even higher on the mountain, looking way out over the ridge of Nupsi here into southern Nepal. This is rather macabre. This is the body of a climber who died on the mountain some two years before. The body is frozen in this uh, very extremely cold environment and unfortunately th there was nothing we could do to remove the body and it's a reminder that this is a dangerous part of the world. Here's the final summit ridge with uh, Sherpa Sondere on the end of the rope looking now down over most of the surrounds. And finally, Chris Kopczynski gets to the summit at about uh, noon on uh, October 21. Uh, the first thing he did there, by the way, was to take out the flag, the only flag he had, turned out to be the flag of Spokane, Washington. We thought that was a little bit uh, parochial, but that was the only flag he had. The next thing he did was to take a photograph looking north into Tibet from uh, the summit. And it's a nice photograph because the only place you can get it if you're climbing Everest from the south is from the summit. So it's a proof that you've got there. Now, of course, it was good news that Chris Kopzinski got to the summit. The bad news was that he wasn't able to carry out any of the physiological measurements. Not because he wasn't keen to do this. He was well-trained, highly motivated, but he couldn't find the equipment. The, the, the weather had been so bad that the equipment which we had at Camp 5 had been covered with snow and ice. He looked all around for it, he couldn't find it, and so unfortunately went to the summit without it. And it turns out that there were only two people left on the expedition who were able to make measurements uh, at these extreme altitudes. Both of them were uh, uh, climbing scientists, people with a, a strong training in physiology, uh, and they both set out for Camp 5, uh, reached it a couple of days later, and fortunately on October 24, the weather was good again, and Chris Pizzo um, was able to get to the summit with his climbing partner, Sherpa Yong Tenzing, and his uh, Yong Tenzing on the summit holding his ice axe in the traditional pose of somebody on the summit. Now this was an extraordinary climb because when Chris Pizzo set out for the summit on the morning of October 24, he couldn't find his ice axe. He'd left it there a few days before, but 
we don't know what had happened to it. I'd been blown off by these high gales or it was, was uh, under snow and ice, we don't know. So Chris couldn't find his ice axe. He wasn't going to wait a couple of days while he went down and came back again with an ice axe. The, the weather was so good. So he picked up a tent pole and started heading for the summit with that. Now there's no way you can get to the summit of Mount Everest with a tent pole. An ice axe is a critical piece of equipment. After Chris had been climbing for an hour or so, he found an ice axe on the ice in front of him. It turned out that it was the ice axe that belonged to the climber whose body I showed you a few slides back. It had been rattling around Mount Everest for the last two years and here it is showed up in front of Chris Pizzo when he needed it. When of course he picked it up, went to the summit with it. Not only did it allow him to get to the summit, but it allowed him to do a whole series of physiological measurements on the summit. And my favorite slide is this one shown here. It's Dr. Chris Pizzo, who's a pathologist who was at Scripps Clinic here in La Jolla at the time. Uh, here he is sitting on the summit of Mount Everest collecting alveolar gas samples. The way he does this is that he uh, breathes out into the special equipment that we designed and built here at UC San Diego. Uh, the, at the end of an expiration, he pulls a lever here and the, the last expired gas is trapped in the between two valves here and the, the, uh, the, the pulling the lever opens the valve of a, an evacuated aluminum can and the gas is trapped in that and uh, six of these samples were brought back to UC San Diego for analysis. So that's how we know his PCO2 is seven or eight millimeters of mercury. And if you look closely at his nose here, you may think it looks a bit blue. That's not surprising because his, his arterial oxygen saturation is pretty low. His arterial PO2 is around about 30. Uh, so his saturation is pretty low. It's not as low as you might think, actually, because of the respiratory alkalosis, but it's still pretty low, and so he's got some cyanosis. So Chris carried out all sorts of measurements. He measured, for example, the barometric pressure, as I, me as I mentioned, for the first time. He also measured his breathing rate as he was climbing without oxygen. He did use oxygen to get to the summit, but he took it off en route, and he measured his respiratory frequency was 80, 80 breaths per minute. So he was breathing very rapidly and shallowly as he was climbing. And he made a number of other measurements as well. We had an electrocardiogram running uh, a Holter monitor, uh, which didn't show anything very peculiar, as a matter of fact, very um, abnormal. Uh, but we, we, he was able to get a whole series of measurements. Chris, however, is not without his idiosyncrasies. As you can see from this slide, the first thing he did when he got to the summit was to take out a Frisbee and throw it into Tibet to get the world's high altitude Frisbee record. And this uh, photograph was in the Guinness Book of Records for a few years. You can see that he was using oxygen to go to the summit. We uh, gave the climbers the option of either using oxygen or not. I was glad they used it because the chances of getting to the summit without oxygen are extremely low and uh, very likely we would not have got any measurements at all. He took the oxygen off, of course, for a long enough period to get uh, 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 gas samples that, uh, for someone who was breathing air on the summit. Well, now, on the same day, October 24, Dr. Peter Hackett, shown here, also set out for the summit with his Sherpa companion. But the Sherpa became very cold, thought that his feet were becoming frostbitten and decided to turn around and go back to Camp 5. And of course, Peter was very disappointed. He didn't have someone to belay the rope. He uh, didn't have enough oxygen. Uh, so he gave up any hope of climbing. He thought he'd just, uh, to the summit, he thought he'd walk up the mountain and meet Chris Pizzo on the way down. And he did meet Chris uh, uh, at about two o'clock in the afternoon. And there was a conversation, and there were two versions of that. But the upshot was that Peter Hackett decided to make a solo summit attempt. Now that was a very foolish decision because it was clear that at that time you couldn't get to the summit and back in daylight. Uh, it's an example of many foolish decisions made at high altitude, almost certainly because the cerebral hypoxia is affecting the uh, CNS function. At any event, uh, Peter Hackett set off
for the summit. And I should emphasize that the summit of Mount Everest, uh, the final ridge, is not a Saturday afternoon walk. Here's the boot marks you can see, if you look carefully perhaps, going up. Uh, here's the summit up here. If you fall on this side, uh, you drop about 8,000 feet to your certain death, of course. If you go through the corners on this side, you fall rather further into Tibet. So uh, it's not to be undertaken lightly. And of course, we were all very concerned about what had happened to Peter. Uh, Chris Pizzo waited for him at the old Camp 6 site that I showed you earlier. Uh, Chris had a radio, was in contact with the rest of us lower on the mountain. And of course, we were all very concerned about what happened to Peter, particularly when Chris took this photograph of the sun going down in the west and another magnificent photograph of Makalu here uh, with uh, Kanchenjunga in the background. And what we eventually determined had happened was as follows. Uh, Peter Hackett did get to the summit uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon or so. Uh, he took some photographs to prove that he'd been there, uh, turned around and started to come down. By that time, of course, he was desperately tired. Climbing alone on a very, very difficult pitch like the one I showed you is extremely tiring. And he encountered some soft snow uh, and he fell. Uh, this was in the so-called Hillary Step, a difficult pitch. Well, of course, normally one falls 8,000 feet to certain death, but un, un, uh, in this situation, apparently Peter fell about 10 feet, got one of his boots caught in a piece of outcropping rock found himself suspended upside down near the summit of Mount Everest, completely alone with the evening coming on. Dangerous situation, of course. Well, he managed to hang on to his ice axe. He was flailing around with his ice axe when he unearthed a piece of fixed rope that had been put in this difficult pitch by some previous expedition. No idea who it was, a bit of old rope. And with the help of that rope, he was able to get himself into the upright position gradually extricate himself from this very dangerous situation and ultimately made his way down to meet Chris at the old Camp 6 site. By then it was dark, but fortunately uh, Chris had a, a lamp, a one headlamp, and they were able to get down to Camp 5, uh, where of course they were safe. The Sherpas were there, they could rehydrate. The following morning they took uh, venous blood samples from each other which gave us the basic cess values we needed to calculate the pH on the summit. And uh, uh, then over the course of the next couple of days, they went down and we all walked out together. On the way out, we called in on the abbot of Tank Bochi and said he was absolutely right. Uh, luck was the most important thing. We were a very fortunate expedition. We had no serious illnesses. Uh, and the climbers and the climbing scientists were able to make a large series of measurements. And as I say, nobody since then has made measurements on the summit. So let's uh, look at some of the conclusions of this study. The climbers on the summit of Mount Everest are very close to the limit of survival because of the severe hypoxia. Very interesting uh, coincidence uh, and just one of those strange things. The barometric pressure on the summit, about 253 millimeters of mercury. Incidentally, that's been uh, measured now several times on the summit. That's the only measurement that has been made. And that's about exactly one third of the sea level value. The most important feature of survival, climatization, survival at those altitudes is extreme hypervent hyperventilation. And the hyperventilation is such that it maintains the alveolar PO2 at about 35 millimeters of mercury. However, the arterial PO2 is lower, around about 30, and that's because there is diffusion limitation across the blood gas barrier. The lung has not evolved to operate at these extreme altitudes. And there is diffusion limitation, particularly during exercise, but of course this was measured at rest. The hyperventilation drives the alveolar PCO2 down to about seven or eight millimeters of mercury. So ventilation, alveolar ventilation, is increased about five-fold. Fantastic degree. And of course the mechanism is the stimulation of the peripheral chemoreceptors by the extremely low PO2 in the arterial blood. The very low PCO2 causes an extreme respiratory alkalosis with an arterial pH between seven and eight. And incidentally, 
you may ask, well, why wasn't there metabolic compensation for the respiratory alkalosis? Well, it's very interesting that the kidney appears to excrete bicarbonate very slowly at these great altitudes. We don't exactly know the reason why. Probably it has to do with the dehydration that all these climbers have, and the kidney is reluctant to excrete bicarbonate uh, and, and uh, exaggerate the degree of, uh, of fluid uh, depletion. At any event, the pH is extremely high, as you'll see. This alkalosis is useful because it increases the oxygen affinity of the hemoglobin and that assists the oxygen uptake in the pulmonary capillary. And finally, the maximal oxygen uptake on the summit, only about one liter a minute, equivalent to walking slowly on the level, but just apparently sufficient to explain how a climber can reach the summit. So I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you and uh, goodbye for now.